Welcome to episode four of season three of Read by the Author. This season we are reading Time Anomaly, and tonight we are on chapter nine. So let's go ahead and get started with the story. Nine. Hold and withhold. Ouch! I yelped, fairly certain that a porcupine was rolling around on my chest. I opened my eyes to find it still dark in the room, and the fur ball that had formerly been a sweet little sleepy kitten now enthusiastically tenderizing the flesh just under my collarbone. I smiled and scratched the kitten's neck. Not squishy enough for you, hmm? He gazed at me with slitted eyes and purr squeaked. A thin leather cord was tied around his neck, and something about the size of a quarter was hanging from the front like a modern pet tag. I raised my head to get a closer look. There wasn't enough light to discern a color, but I could make out the shape of the object. It was an eye, a wedjet, specifically, the most common symbol of the mythological version of Haru. What are you doing with an eye of Horus amulet, little guy? I believe it was meant to identify the giver of the gift, dear Alexandra. I started at the sound of Nguyen's voice. He was standing in the curtained wall, the blue linen pushed to the side as he watched me. Sorry, Nguyen, I didn't mean to fall asleep on your bed. And honestly, I didn't know how I had fallen asleep. The thin pads set on whatever made up the bed frame it didn't exactly create a cushy mattress by modern standards, or by any standards, for that matter. My joints felt stiff and creaky, and a dull ache was throbbing in the base of my skull. I sat up, shifting the kitten down to my lap. It curled into a ball roughly the size of a softball, let out a heavy sigh, and promptly dozed off. I just... I didn't know where else to go. Nguyen held out his hands, palms up. My bed is your bed, wife. Right. You know this is never going to be that kind of marriage, right? Nguyen chuckled and entered the room. He sat beside me on the bed and raised his arm, wrapping it around my shoulders and pulling me close. I have plenty of other wives for that. Is it going to raise any eyebrows if I have my own room? After pressing a gentle kiss against my hair, Nguyen shook his head. Such a thing is normal among Nishorets, especially when there are more than two people involved in a union. Otherwise, the arrangement can become a bit awkward. A weak laugh bubbled in my chest. I bet. He gave my shoulders a squeeze. We will be leaving in a day or two, and I'll arrange for you and your priestesses, should they choose to accompany you, to have your own tent. But until then, I would like you to stay with me in these rooms. When I glanced up at him, he smiled. For appearances, the closer onlookers believe our union to be, the safer you'll be. Smiling weakly, I nodded. Whatever you say, O oh great and powerful husband. Sarcasm is very unladylike, wife. I snorted. As is snorting. Look at you, making jokes. I nudged his side with my elbow. And here I thought your ability to do that faded 10 or 20,000 years ago. I yawned, making my final few words unintelligible. Nguyen laughed softly. Nguyen? Mm. Why did Haru give me a kitten? Nguyen took a deep breath and shifted to lie back on the bed. He pulled me down with him, keeping me close against his side. I rested my head on his shoulder and cradled the kitten against my tummy. I may never have had a truly sexual relationship with Nguyen, but I had always found comfort in his arms. After all, he had been my hidden guardian and best friend for most of my life. My ancient, secret, godlike best friend. He came to me this evening, asking what sorts of things bring you happiness, Nguyen said. When I asked him why he wondered such a thing, he told me of the conversation you two had about missing your home. So I told him of your love of cats. I believe that's what motivated him to give you the creature. I don't know how to be around him, I said sleepily. I know, child. 
Will it get easier? That I do not know. I think I'll call him Russ, I said with another yawn. Short for Horace. Oh. My grandson, you would be very confused if you did. No, my eyes drooped shut. The kitten. I was standing in the bedroom of Marcus's and my suite in the council's Cairo palace. The room had been all but torn apart. The king-sized mattress lay askew against one wall, all the way across the room from the now crooked bed frame and bronze headboard. Chunks of gold-veined black granite that had once been part of a coffee table littered the polished marble floor, mixed with shards of glass and ceramic in a bevy of colors. And in the center of it all was Marcus. He was sitting on the floor, leaning back against an overturned armchair, one knee drawn up. His arm rested on his knee, his hand hanging limply. Blood dripped from his fingertips onto the once pristine ivory marble floor. His white button-down shirt hung open, carmine stains streaking and spotting it here and there, and he was missing one of his loafers. There was no doubt in my mind that I was in the aught, witnessing the result of Marcus's reaction to what he'd done to me when he'd been under a pep's control. For someone who was so practiced at being in control, the experience must have been maddening. He would have been aware the whole time, watching, feeling himself drown me. He likely blamed himself, and I didn't think self-forgiveness would come easily for him. Not for this. I knelt on the floor in front of him and reached out, brushing my fingertips against the ought barrier that separated me from the echo of him. I love you, I whispered. I'll come back to you. I promise. Lex, is it really you? The man who spoke wasn't Marcus, but he was the next best thing. Dominic. His faint French accent had never sounded so good. I spun on my knees and stared at my half-brother. Tall, slender, and pale, he had black hair that was slicked back elegantly and sharp, handsome features. He was the one who had remained by my side while Marcus had abandoned me in his last-ditch effort to avoid the prophecy that would bind us together permanently. He had been the one to comfort me when the waves of depression had been so powerful they threatened to wash me away completely. Where Nguyen had been my closest friend for most of my life, Dominic filled that role now. We can find you. You've disappeared from the out completely. He closed the distance between us, crouched down to grip my shoulders, and picked me up, crushing me against him in a hug that was equal parts pain and comfort. Though he had a slimmer build than Marcus, his lean muscles held nearly as much strength. Crushing me? Can't really breathe, I managed to grunt. Sorry. He let up a bit. Tell me where you are so we can come and get you. Marcus is already showing signs of bonding withdrawals, and he thinks they'll hit you more quickly because you are so much younger. We need to get you back to him as soon as possible. I'm... I started to say, but despite his unrelenting hold, the rainbow colors of the art swept in, separating us, and both the Echo and Dominic disappeared. No! I howled. Somehow I had managed to actually travel to my own time in the art, not just view the future Echo, but that time had slipped away like water between my fingers. My head throbbed as the colors continued to swirl around me, a furious chaos, and I clutched my non-existent scalp, trying to keep my skull from exploding. I screamed with non-existent lungs. I tore at my non-existent hair. I lashed out at the increasingly frenzied movement of the ought. Nothing happened. Nothing relieved the pain. As I came fully awake, I groaned and curled into a ball, hugging my knees. The pain that had overwhelmed my ba in the aught abated, and I slowly unclenched my muscles and relaxed. My mouth tasted sour, like bile. Did I throw up in my sleep? I opened my eyes to the golden light of morning streaming in through the high windows, flopped onto my back, and sighed. It looked like bonding withdrawals had started. I wondered if that was the reason my Ba had searched out the future version of Haru in the Aught. 
I would have asked Nguyen, except he was no longer in the room. Patting the thin pads that were pretending to be a mattress, I searched for Russ. When I didn't find his furry little body, I sat up and looked around. As far as I could tell, he wasn't anywhere in the room either. I took care of my most urgent personal business first, hurrying into the walled-off alcove containing the Old Kingdom equivalent of a toilet, a sort of U-shaped stool with an opening cut out of the seat and a large ceramic vase set underneath. Feeling much relieved, I left the bedchamber in search of Russ, and hopefully someone who could explain the current method for cleaning teeth. I was pretty sure it included a stick and a paste of minerals of some kind, but I wasn't sure where to find such implements, let alone how to use them. Russ, as it turned out, was chasing insects in the courtyard. It was my first chance to get a good look at him in any sort of substantial light. He had the coloring of an Abyssinian, with tan, ticked fur that darkened to a brownish black on his back, except his fur was longer and fluffier than any Abyssinian I had ever seen. I didn't think he would grow into a long-haired cat, but I hoped he would at least always be a little fluffy. I leaned against a column and watched him for a few minutes, hoping the dull ache in my head and joints was just a remnant of the withdrawal symptoms I had felt in the aught. Why these symptoms seemed to affect my ba far more intensely and quickly than they affected my physical body was just one more thing I needed to ask Nguyen. Ah, you are up, Aset said cheerily from behind me. Did you sleep well? Not exactly, I told her as I turned to face her. This is sort of embarrassing, but can you show me how to clean my teeth? I raised my shoulders and scrunched my brow. You guys do things a bit differently here. Aset's face broke into a kind, almost motherly smile. Of course. Come with me. She turned and headed toward the doorway to the hall, leading back to Nguyen's rooms. I jogged a few steps to catch up to her. Also, this is definitely embarrassing. What am I supposed to do about cleaning out the, um, chamber pot? If it is no longer, um, empty. A set laughed. It was a musical sound that instantly put me at ease. I have seen much of the future, though not so far as the time from whence you come. And I know that many things change, our hygiene practices chief among them. She wrinkled her nose and glanced at me sideways. And not all of those changes are always for the better. I laughed, thinking of the Middle Ages in Europe. I know exactly what you mean. I honestly thought it would be stinkier back, well, now. But it is actually a relief not to be overwhelmed by so many artificial scents. There had definitely been a little ripeness when we'd been surrounded by the crowd at the pyramid complex, and there had been an abundance of floral and herbal-scented oils, but none had been as pungent as some of the colognes and perfumes worn, sometimes practically bathed in, by humans of my own time. Well, you are surrounded by people who are aware of the sensitive senses of our kind, so they make an effort to wash often and to not overly perfume their bodies. It is an effort I definitely appreciate. Aset smiled and raised her eyebrows. As do I. She led the way back into Nguyen's private area, through the sitting room and into the bedchamber. She crouched before a wooden chest that was about the size of a shoebox and was inlaid with intricate patterns of ivory and some dark wood. Much like a jewelry box, it had a top that could be raised and the bottom half was divided evenly into three drawers that could be opened by pulling on a polished ivory knob. Aset opened the leftmost drawer, revealing a squat alabaster jar with a wooden stopper and a small pile of sticks with frayed tips. She plucked a stick out of the mass and handed it to me, then selected another for herself. After unstoppering the jar, she dipped her index finger into the chalky paste within and started spreading it on her teeth. I mirrored her movements. The paste was bitter and a little salty, making me wonder if it contained the ancient predecessor of baking soda, Natron. When she started scrubbing her teeth with the frayed end of the stick, I did the same, being careful not to scrape so hard that I made my gums bleed. I watched as a set rose and scooped a palm full of water from the wash basin and slurped it into her mouth. She swished it around for a few seconds, retreated to the toilet alcove, and, based on the sound, spit the water and paste into the waste vessel. All clean, she said with a bright grin as she reemerged. 
I did as she had done, and when I returned to the main part of the bedchamber, she showed me where I could store my tooth stick in the rightmost drawer of the chest. A set leaned in unexpectedly and gave me a sniff. You do not smell ripe, so we will wait until this evening to wash, yes? Um, okay, I said, feeling a little uncomfortable that she had just sniffed me, and more than a little ridiculous that I had to be shown how to handle basic hygiene. But it had to be done if she was offering. And if she was offering, I wasn't about to turn her down. Are you hungry? she asked. The cooks like to make a delicious honey bread in the mornings. She linked her arm with mine and guided me back out of Nguyen's private rooms. I am sure you will like it. I glanced over my shoulder. And the chamber pot? They are checked regularly. It will be emptied. Have no worries. Okay. As we walked, I rubbed my temple, fairly certain that the aches and pains were getting worse. Nguyen hadn't been worried about either my or Marcus's withdrawals, so I figured he had to know some trick, some way to slow or lessen the symptoms, some way for it not to be fatal. I cleared my throat. Do you know where Nguyen is, by any chance? He is out making the final arrangements for the journey, but he should be back later this morning, she said with a nod. I sighed. It looked like my questions would just have to wait. Everyone keeps mentioning a journey. Where are we going? I stopped halfway down the central walkway to scoop up Russ. He nestled in the crook of my arm, purring lazily. Nobody has told you yet. She glanced at me, a tiny frown turning down the corners of her mouth. We are returning to the Netjerat Oasis, deep in the heart of the desert. Oh, it was my turn to frown. That sounds... sandy. A set laughed. The trip there, yes. The oasis, not so much. It is... it is hard to describe, but it is very beautiful, very lush. She shrugged. It is home. The ache in my head gave a rather enthusiastic throb, and I squeezed my eyes shut for a moment. If Nguyen wasn't around to help me, there was only one way to alleviate the withdrawal pains. At least, only one way that I knew of. Do you know if Haru is around? I raised my arm slightly, earning a muffled squeak from Russ. I wanted to thank him for his gift. Oh, I'm sure he's around here somewhere. For some reason, her response gave me the impression that she knew where Haru was, but she didn't particularly want to tell me. 10. Request and Deny the honey breads were actually more like muffins, and they were pretty tasty, if a little bland. I couldn't say the same on either account of the tangy fruit juice that accompanied them. It was so tart that my eyes started to water and my mouth stung with the need to salivate profusely after the first sip. Regardless, I ate and drank everything a set offered to me, knowing I would need the nourishment to make up for my lack of appetite the previous evening. If there was one thing I didn't want to be, it was a malnourished Nezuret. That way lie all sorts of undesirable temporary side effects, like advanced age progression or sudden weight loss, not to mention weakening my body's ability to withstand the bonding withdrawals. Aset and I sat on one of the built-in benches sheltered within the porticos surrounding the courtyard as we shared our basket of honey breads and pitcher of juice. Russ spent the time stalking the tiny birds that were hopping around the garden, wiggling his backside awkwardly as he prepared for each pounce. It must be very strange for you, seeing him like this, Aset commented. I looked at her, brow furrowed. My brother. She finished the final honey bread and dry washed the crumbs from her fingers. Strange is an understatement, I muttered. Taking a deep breath, I asked the question that had been perched on the tip of my tongue the entire time we'd been eating. I know you were hiding something earlier, when I asked you if you knew where Haru was. Aset studied me, her gaze unwavering, but she didn't say anything. Is it that you disapprove of me? Of us? I inhaled deeply and held my breath. She shook her head. No, Lex. It's just that, well, 
you must remember that time changes a person, and Haru is not the man you are bonded to. Not yet. I do not wish for you to be disappointed or hurt or worse. I understand. With a sigh, I patted her hand. I think I need some alone time to think. You do not mind, do you? Smiling faintly, she shook her head again. No, dear Lex, I do not. You have been through quite a shock, I think. Alone time, as you put it, would be wise. I returned her smile, then rose and gathered up the empty reed basket, placing both the ceramic pitcher and the alabaster cups within. I will return this to the kitchen. Aset nodded, making no move to rise. Thank you for everything this morning, Aset. You have been an enormous help, I told her, my gratitude sincere, and turned to walk away, scooping up Russ as I went. After returning the items to the kitchen, I retreated to Nguyen's sitting room, but several minutes of pacing was all I could stand, and my headache seemed to worsen with each step. I couldn't stay there, doing nothing. So, alone and barefoot, I headed out to the hallway to explore. And by explore, I meant find Haru. There were four curtained doorways lining the hallway, and each led to sets of private chambers, much like Nguyen's, but smaller. They were all empty. When I reached the courtyard, I checked to make sure a set wasn't anywhere in sight, then snuck along the covered walkway to the next offshooting hall. It was nearly identical to the one ending in Nguyen's rooms. As quietly as possible, I made my way into the hall. Just as I was approaching the second set of curtained doorways, I caught the hushed sound of whispering voices. It was coming from the doorway on the right. I froze, straining to hear enough to identify the speakers. If Haru wasn't one of them, I would move on. I focused all of my attention on listening and scowled when I realized they weren't speaking the original tongue, but old Egyptian. I frowned as an idea struck me. Haru had claimed he was interested in teaching me the contemporary language. I wondered if taking him up on that offer, regardless of whether it had been a serious offer, might be the best way to spend some time around him to ease at least a bit of the withdrawal pains. A bark of laughter came from the room, unmistakably Haru's, and it was closely followed by a solitary clapping sound, possibly a slap, and a feminine yelp. Haru was in that room, and he was with a woman, and if the sound had indeed been a slap, he had hit the woman. Or had the woman hit him? I inched closer. Haru was speaking, no longer a whisper, and though I couldn't understand his words, I could distinguish the sharp-edged tone. He was clearly displeased. At the sound of a moan and a throaty feminine laugh, I second-guessed my assessment. There was one other situation I had heard his voice take on such an edge, but no, it couldn't be that. If I was hearing some sort of sexual interlude between Haru and another woman, I would lose it. I would most likely burst into the room and tear the other woman away from him, and then I would be Nguyen's psychotic, voyeuristic wife with a violent streak and an unhealthy obsession with her husband's grandson. I shook my head, working up the courage to just walk away. Haru said something else, and I heard footsteps nearing the doorway. I glanced around wildly, then lunged across the hall to the curtain blocking off the doorway opposite the one where I had been eavesdropping. Thankfully, one quick look around the sitting room told me it was empty. I pressed my back against the plaster wall beside the doorway and held my breath, taking in a full dose of the spicy scent that filled the room. I held in a groan. There was no mistaking Haru's enticing, exotic scent. I had no doubt that I had hidden in his private quarters. Of course I did. Much to my horror, Haru pushed through the curtain and entered the room, pausing mid-step when he saw me. An eyebrow quirked up curiously, but he didn't say anything as he continued into the room. He raised his index finger to his lips in the apparently timeless gesture signaling the need for silence and glanced at the curtain. It seemed that he didn't want the woman, whoever she was, to know I was in there. There were more footsteps, and they stopped on the other side of the curtain. Haru, a woman called into the room, then said something else I didn't understand. My blood boiled as I recognized her voice. 
on Kess and Pepe. She was the woman he had been with in the other room, the one who had moaned and laughed far too suggestively. A violent, burning rage flared to life within me. Haru snapped an answer to Ankes and Pepe, his tone notably dismissive, and not long after, there was the sound of quick footsteps moving up the hallway toward the courtyard. Haru and I watched each other while we listened until the footsteps were no longer audible. And even then, we stared for several more seconds. My back was still pressed against the wall, and my chest was rising and falling too quickly with each shallow breath. What are you doing in here? He asked me in the original tongue. His eyes narrowed. Only when he turned away, breaking our eye contact, was I able to take a full breath. I am sorry. I truly did not mean to. I sidestepped to the doorway, looking anywhere but at him. I shall go. Wait. I paused and, after a long, painful moment, managed to look at him. He eased down into a wooden chair beside a narrow senate table on the far side of the room and rubbed a hand over his closely shaved scalp. Apologies, Hathor. You caught me off guard. Please come. Sit with me. He indicated the chair on the opposite side of the table. Slowly, I crossed the room and did as he bid, sitting primly and clasping my hands in my lap, but I couldn't make myself meet his eyes. Based on your evident retreat into my rooms, I can only assume you overheard my conversation with Ankes and Pepe. I bit my lip, sort of but not exactly. I heard some of it, but you should not be worried. I could not understand it. I flicked my gaze up to his face, but his expression gave nothing away. I am so sorry. I should not have eavesdropped, but I was looking for you, and... Intrigue flashed in his golden eyes. You were looking for me? Why? To thank you. For Russ. I shook my head. For the kitten. And to ask if you were serious about your offer to teach me the common language? Some hidden tension within Haru seemed to ease, and he relaxed in his chair. I am no longer certain that is such a good idea. At his hesitancy, my heart started to sink. Why not? Because you are the wife of Nguyen. I was his wife when you first made the offer, I reminded him. And because I would prefer not to make settling in here any harder than it has already been for you. I leaned forward and licked my lips. But do you not see? Learning the common language will make settling in here easier, and... His jaw clenched. You should ask my sister. You and Asset seem to be getting along quite well. Sparked by his avoidance, my temper smoldered. If you have no desire to help me, please just say so. I merely thought that since you offered. I shrugged and stood. Clearly, I was mistaken. Thank you for the kitten. Turning, I strode toward the doorway. Hathor, stop. Haru commanded, and I heard hints of my Haru in his younger version's voice. I halted in front of the curtain, my spine rigid. Something about him calling me my false name made my smoldering temper flare. I closed my eyes and took a deep, calming breath. Than another. Ankes and Pepe is a dangerous woman to have as an enemy, he said. How did you manage to make one of her so quickly? I glanced down at my forearm. The skin was unblemished now, but it had been marred by angry red scratches only the night before. You, I said softly, not caring that it was only the partial truth, then passed through the curtain. 11. Reveal and Revile I returned to Nguyen's rooms after another quick stop by the kitchen, carrying two bowls, both for rest. One contained an odd concoction of some sort of grain gruel, like barley, a raw egg yolk, and chopped up chunks of some light meat that had been stewing in a copper pot over the fire a few feet away from the outdoor oven. The cook, Henny, had mixed it all together in a dish the size of a modern cereal bowl, then handed the bowl to me, along with another empty one for water. Russ was asleep on one of the chairs in the sitting room when I passed through the curtain. He was sprawled on his back, his forelegs stretched above his head, and his hind legs extended so his rear paws hung over the edge of the chair, and his round little belly bulged comically. 
It was ridiculously adorable. I crossed the room and held the bowl of kitten glop near his nose. His whiskers twitched, closely followed by his nose, and within seconds his eyes were open and he was stretching his neck out to get closer to the food. I set the bowl on the floor near one of the chair legs. You've got to get up, lazy boy. Russ part jumped, part fell off the chair in his eagerness to gorge himself. Have at it, I told him, laughing softly. I retreated into the bedchamber to fill the other dish with water from the washing bowl, then returned to sit on the floor and watch my kitten eat and purr simultaneously. When I tried to pet him, he added a faint growl to the mix. Okay, okay, your food, not mine. Got it. And here I was so looking forward to having a snack. At the sound of footsteps, I glanced over my shoulder. Nguyen had entered the sitting room. Wearing the same white linen kilt wrapped around his lower half that every other man of this time seemed to favor. He crossed the room, crouched on one knee beside me, and took hold of my chin, turning my face from side to side and peering into my eyes. Frowning, he released me and sighed. Your withdrawal symptoms are advancing more rapidly than I anticipated, he said in English. This will greatly affect the deterioration my shoot causes to your ba. You won't have time to learn everything you need to learn, complete your task, and rid yourself of the power safely. (sighs) This day just keeps getting better and better, I grumbled, rubbing the back of my neck in a vain attempt to relieve the ache. So what am I supposed to do about the withdrawals? Because having my soul torn apart isn't really that appealing. My dear Alexandra, at this rate, you'll be dead long before the power within you has a chance to do any such thing. Blanching, I stared at him. What? What are you talking about? At the rate your symptoms are progressing, the bonding withdrawals will kill you within a week, unless we can find a way for you to start feeding the bond. But, but I can't feed the bond. You can. No, I really can't. I tried to feed it. I blushed at what my words implied. I mean, not like that, exactly. But I went to talk to Haru, asked him to teach me the common tongue so I'd have an excuse to be around him and soak up whatever residual bonding pheromones he might give off. But he said no. Suddenly overwhelmed, I started blinking rapidly in an effort to hold back tears. Maybe if we told him, he'd be more understanding? Nguyen shook his head. I am not convinced that that is the wisest path. Haru has, well... I guess you could call them strong opinions about bonding. What do you mean? He views such relationships as weaknesses, and I think you'll agree that weakness is something both his and your Heru detest. He paused. The possibility that it would drive him away is too great. All would fall apart. I stared into his rainbow eyes, so full of intelligence and concern, and swallowed roughly. Nguyen squeezed my shoulder. You will spend time with Heru. I'll see to that. But for now, I'd advise against telling him anything about your future relationship. Perhaps when he has come to know you better. But not yet. Feeling the oddest sense of rejection, I nodded. How will you get him to spend time with me? I hated the idea of Haru being forced to be around me, especially when he seemed so opposed to the idea. But then, dying would be a whole lot worse. The hint of a smile teased Nguyen's mouth. I'm sure I'll come up with something. A wave of cold fear washed over me as I recalled what Dominic had told me in the aught, that Marcus was already showing signs of withdrawals as well. Nguyen, what about Marcus? Haru, in my time... He might be a little tougher than I am, but won't he eventually be in as much danger? I frowned, thinking of the only other instance I had left my own time. Am I still anchored to my timeline? If I was, then however many days passed for me in this ancient time, the same number passed for Marcus in my native time. Can we, I don't know, un-anchor me? Nguyen shook his head. There are some limitations to your body that even my shoot can't overcome. 
you will forever be anchored to your original timeline whenever you are. So we only have so much time until Marcus... I blinked, breaking the seal, holding my welling tears at bay. Dies. As matters currently stand, yes. Nguyen reached out, wiping the tears away with his thumb before brushing a strand of hair out of my face and hooking it behind my ear. Which means we must change how matters currently stand. I sniffled. But (laughs) how? Nguyen smiled. You are about to have your first lesson in how to use your new powers. The vibrant colors swirling around in his irises dulled for a moment, and I realized he had entered the ot. A few seconds later, he returned, blinking as he rose to his feet. Come, dear Alexandra, there are two more people you will need for this task. Okay. I cleared my throat and gave what I thought was a pretty valiant effort to pull myself together. I stood, brushing off my backside and stretching in another vain attempt to alleviate the ache sinking ever deeper into my muscles, bones, and joints, into my ba, my very soul. Who else do we need? And what task? A set and one other. And the task is saving your Heru. We found a set in the Hathur temple, standing on the ramp just outside the inner sanctuary, and speaking with Denai and a fairly pale man with light brown shoulder-length hair and a trim physique. A set smiled when she noticed us approaching. Denai bowed her head to a set and the man as we neared, then turned and bowed to Nguyen and me in turn. Her bow to me was deepest, despite what I had confessed to her the previous evening. She slipped away on hurried bare feet, herding a few stray priestesses as she went. Within seconds of our arrival, Nguyen and I were alone with Aset and her companion inside the temple. The man turned to face Nguyen and me as we joined him and Aset on the ramp. For a moment, I forgot all about my and Haru's apparently impending deaths, because I recognized this man. I had met him once, on a bus, before I had learned what I really was— so I had been unable to recognize him for what he really was. Nejeret. His hair had been dyed blue and styled in short spikes, and his kind, handsome face had been pierced in a number of places, giving him an edgy, menacing look. But his eyes, those pale, almost silvery blue irises, those were the same. He had claimed they were contacts at the time, but now I knew better. He was staring at me almost as hard as I was staring at him, a faint, friendly smirk curving his thin lips. Nekure, Nguyen said. I do not believe you have met Alexandra. The man, Nekure, grinned, glancing only briefly at Nguyen before returning his focus to me and bowing. A pleasure, my queen. I, too, glanced at Nguyen. I am not your queen. Nekure flashed another broad grin and gave a slight sideways nod. As you wish, my goddess. I pressed my lips together and breathed out through my nose. I am not a... He knows, Lex, Aset said. She stepped closer to me and, linking our arms, pulled me toward the sanctuary. He is teasing you. She glanced over her shoulder as we passed through the doorway. Side by side, it was a tight squeeze, but we managed. It was cooler inside the sanctuary than it was out in the main temple, and just as dim as it had been when I first arrived, but I was still entranced by the colorful hieroglyphs and symbolic depictions of the goddess Hathur. He is the only other person who knows the truth about who you are and from whence you come, Aset added, and it took me a moment to realize she was talking about Nekure. My eyes bulged. You told him? Aset, you cannot go around telling people about me. Aset rolled her eyes as she sat on the floor, pulling me down with her. I grumbled internally that the limestone floor would probably leave a dirt smudge on my one and only dress, the same one I had swapped my original shift with Denai for the previous evening. It was a silly concern, but then I really didn't love the idea of walking around with a dark smudge on my butt for the next who knew how long. 
Oh, please, Lex, Asat said. You are the one who told me I could confide in him, that I had to confide in him. Frowning, I shook my head. I felt like I had been doing a lot of both lately. You are speaking of when we met in your past? Asat nodded. And your future. Uh Uh-huh. Nguyen and Nakure sat as well, Nakure beside Aset and Nguyen beside me, so we made a neat little square inside the sanctuary. I continued to stare at Aset. And did I tell you why it was necessary to confide in him? Because he is essential to helping you complete the process that will restore Ma'at to the universe. I looked at Nguyen, then Nakure, then back at Aset. Which is... Smiling, Aset shook her head. Not something you can know yet. You told me that, too. I took a deep breath, held it for several seconds as I scanned the faces of these three people who suddenly seemed to know more about my past and future than I did. Again, my gaze settled on Aset. Is there anything else you should tell me that I told you not to tell me about? I asked, just a touch petulant. Aset grinned, a mysterious glint shining in her eyes, but she didn't say anything. The seconds of silence stretched out until finally I sighed. All right, Nguyen, what is this task we came here to do? Nekure, Nguyen said with a nod. Following Nguyen and Aset's lead, I looked at Nekure. His eyes were closed and his hand was outstretched in front of him, like he was waiting to catch something dropping from the ceiling. Without warning, his eyes opened and his hand closed. When he uncurled his fingers, a tiny crystalline butterfly rested in the center of his palm. My eyes widened. What? Is that made of ot? Nakure nodded. I glanced at Nguyen, then back at the other Nejaret. And you just made it? Again, he nodded, and as he did... The little butterfly evaporated in a poof of colorful mist. But how? You are just a Netjarat. I shook my head slowly and focused on Nguyen. You could do that, but a Netjarat? Ah, but Nekure is not just a Netjarat, Nguyen said, his colorful eyes glittering even in the dim light of the sanctuary. Confusion creased my brow. He is not? He is my son, Aset said. I blinked in surprise and stared at Aset. Her son? That is impossible. Female Netjarat are physically incapable of having children. After manifestation, Nguyen said. Which is why, from the moment my first Netjarat offspring was born, I forbade any female Netjarat to lie with a man, Netjarat or human, prior to manifestation. The resulting offspring would prove to be too powerful, a vessel for a pep, should he come to know of its existence. Nguyen shook his head slowly, regret filling his eyes. I underestimated my counterpart's determination and depravity. He sighed. I do not understand. I stared at Aset. So, how? Aset sighed. I was taken shortly after my twentieth year just when I started to show the first signs of pre-manifestation. He was a possessed Necher Ot from the lands to the north, who had offered his body to a pep willingly, and he stole me away from my mother's home, wounding Haru in the process. He intended to take me away, to the cold lands, but before he could, I was saved, and he was... Her lip curled. No longer a problem. I glanced at Nguyen for the briefest moment, and, based on his stony expression, concluded that he had been the one to rescue a set. But I was not saved before he could have his way with me. I met a set's eyes, her hard, challenging stare, and realized that she had told me about this once before, when I was in the hospital after waking from a coma that resulted from an attempted date rape. It was a long time ago, and no longer has a hold over my life, but I understand the terror she had said. I reached for her hand and gave it a squeeze. I said, I am so sorry for what you went through. She offered me a tight smile. I have made my peace with it, 
She looked at Nakure, her eyes suddenly shimmering with unshed tears. And now I have my son, the only child born of two Netjarat, though only we four and Haru know his true nature. I shook my head and fixed my gaze on Nguyen. But why does that make him anything different from a regular Netjarat? Because such a union not only generates a child, Nguyen said, but a new shoot not nearly as powerful or multifaceted as the one you currently hold within you, but it does give the Netcher Ot some unique talents. Nikure is a special case, but aside from him, such a being cannot be allowed to exist. Because it is too risky, I said. He nodded. So, I looked at Nikure. Your unique shoot talent is being able to create things from the Ot, I said, and he nodded. My eyes narrowed, and focusing on Nguyen, I switched to English. How do you know he's the only one? I mean, think about how many people are alive in my time. People who might manifest. Ah, but it is a simple task to see who will manifest by searching the possible futures in the art. Except nobody knew I was going to manifest. Because I was cloaking any such futures. I could not let Haru prevent your birth because he saw that you'd eventually manifest and bring about the prophecy. All that has happened had to happen exactly as it did, so Ma'at can be restored. Nguyen shook his head, frowning just a bit. Come now, dear Alexandra, you already know this. My fingers clutched the linen skirt of my dress. You're right, I do. But what I don't know is how... Ma'at will be restored. What will I have to do? He held my gaze, but said nothing. How will I get rid of this damn power that's killing me? I need to know, Nguyen. He interlocked his fingers and rested his hands over his ankles. In time, when you are ready. I clenched my jaw, closed my eyes, and took a deep breath. And when I raised my eyelids, I spoke very softly, enunciating very clearly. I'm willing to trust you because of everything we've been through together, and because I know you play the long game, and you must have some reason I couldn't possibly comprehend for not filling me in, but only so long as you swear to me that there really is a way for me to survive this, for Marcus to survive this. I stared at Nguyen, watching him not respond. Swear to me, Nguyen. I need this. He blinked twice, one corner of his mouth lifted in that insanely irritating half-smile he favored, and finally he nodded. I swear to you, dear Alexandra, that there is a way for both you and Heru to survive this and restore Ma'at to the universe. I exhaled and rubbed my hand over the lower half of my face. Fine, that's good enough for now. I paused, hesitating. So, you've been extra diligent about checking the ought to prevent Nezirets from getting pregnant before they've manifested. Except for a set. Why'd you let it happen to her? Why'd you wait until after she was raped to rescue her? Why didn't you? I was away, Alexandra, and the Nezirets Apep had possessed was very good at cloaking so no others detected his intentions before he could carry out the act. You were away, I repeated, not appeased one bit. Yes, Alexandra, I was away, searching for the Nezirets who could restore balance to the universe. He paused, and I dreaded what I knew was coming next. I was searching for you. All right, that's it for this episode of Read by the Author. I'll be back next week to continue with Chapter 12 of Time Anomaly. Until then...